we need to reshape the conversation so we're thinking about how to create lasting peace in the Horn of Africa as a whole. There's a history of European colonialism. There's a history of intra-African colonialism. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to the Harambe Today podcast. This is episode nine. Ethiopia's federal system is organized along ethnic lines, and whether that has been a good or bad thing for the country is the subject of much debate. In this episode, we'll discuss the history of how Ethiopia became a state and the pros and cons of ethnic federalism. The link to the full transcript with the names of the people featured in this episode is in the show notes. All right, let's get into it. It depends on what we mean by Ethiopia, because Ethiopia is an ancient name. It's a name that the Greek historian Herodotus, when he visited Egypt, he saw black people coming to Egypt and and he asked who these people are. And they told him that they come from the south and he called them Ethiopians, which means the land of burnt faces. Some historians say Ethiopia started 3000 years ago as a country, as a nation. But to be sure, the modern Ethiopian state, and put it that way, modern Ethiopian state actually was a result of the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. The difference is that when Europeans conquered and colonized and carved up territories, the emperor, Emperor Menelik, who is the king of the kingdom of Shawa, participated in the struggle. He conquered the southern part of Ethiopia and created the Ethiopian empire. From that point of view, Ethiopia is basically 120 or 30 years old, the modern Ethiopian state. How was it governed? Well, under Menelik, it was really basically the beginning of the end of the conquest and beginning of pacification. There was really no coherent governance style. The government is still expanding. The peripheries have not been integrated. The territories have not been delimited and demarcated. It was really an experiment in governance. Governance actually started, as I would characterize it, under Emperor Haile Selassie, who began his career as a regent in 1916, after the ouster of one of the young princes as king of Ethiopia, and established a centralized, unitary, autocratic state. Really, to characterize it, that's what I would say. The modern state came into being under Emperor Menelik. He established the first cabinet. He started sending emissaries to Europe. But it's not really an integrated state. It was still expanding. But under Haile Selassie, especially after 1930, after he became the emperor of Ethiopia, that's where personalists, autocratic and centralized system of governance, monarchical system of government was put in place. That was disrupted by the Italian invasion in 1935. But once he got back from Europe and reestablished himself, that is really when he put in place the modern Ethiopian state that is governed in the modern way. He opened schools, sent many to modern schools to really begin a modern bureaucracy. And that system remained in place with some constitution. A second constitution was uh, proclaimed in 1955. Some kind of a semblance of legal, constitutional, but extremely centralized and autocratic monarchy was in place until 1974. In 1974, unrest or upheaval broke out. A military government came in place, proclaimed the country a socialist republic, and several experiments led to the establishment of, at the end, the People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Now, it was not people's because it was still a military leader that was president or leader of the country. It was not democratic because there was really no democracy. In fact, under the socialist doctrine, what they called this democratic centralism, but it was basically a one-man rule. It was not republic. Of course, there was no king, but there was really no republican system of government at the time. It was really simply a military rule in civilian clothing. That ended in 1991 with the coming of Tigran People's Liberation Front-led current government. Emperor Hanus IV, his entire 
brain was fighting. And his general at that time was Ras Alula Abanaga. He's the one who established Asmara as a city that was during his uh, administration. They were fighting uh, not only for the rest parts of Ethiopia, but also for Eritrea, saying that Eritrea was part of Ethiopia historically. Menelik signed Eritrea over to the Italians because the Italians promised to provide them with guns. And Menelik had an ambition to be the emperor of Ethiopia. At that time, the emperor of Ethiopia was Johannes from Tigray. He signed the Treaty of Wichale, in which he actually recognized Italian control of Eritrea. The Italians were trying to use the Machiavellian theory to divide the Ethiopians' strong groups, Tigrians, Eritrean Tigrians, and Ethiopian Abyssinian and Amharas. Menelik represented the Amhara power, Johannes represented the Tigray power. But in order to divide them, they would provide guns to Menelik to actually make him stronger against Emperor Johannes. They provided him with over 100,000 guns. At that time, it's a huge amount, like someone giving you 1,000 uh, jets, you know, to get today's terms. But Menelik was more interested in getting all those guns to subdue the south. You see, Walaita, Oromia, Kafa, and all those areas in the south, because that is where the riches are. And so he used those guns to actually expand into the south. Haile Selassie sort of tried to create this fiction of Ethiopian one big happy family, and it wasn't that at all. There were several ethnic groups or nations and nationalities, that's the proper term, that were conquered or incorporated into the Ethiopian Empire, but that the empire never really succeeded in integrating them into the economic and political fabric. That the rulers at the center always kept power in their own hands and marginalized, especially the ethnic groups that they had conquered and incorporated. In particular, the majority, the nation that actually constitutes the largest population and occupy the largest land mass within the empire were kept at bay. They never really participated in the government that the government was really a government dominated by one culture. And this is not like an accusation against the government. It was a policy of assimilation that the imperial government of Emperor Haile Selassie followed. That is through education, through mass culture, through the media, through the church, that they will create one nation under one king belonging to one culture and, if possible, speak one language that every other ethnic group was through the mechanisms that I just outlined, would become assimilated and take on the Amhara culture, and then they become Ethiopia. That Ethiopia or being an Ethiopian is not a matter of citizenship. It becomes a matter of identity. So whether you are a Somali or an Oromo or a Kambata, you belong to any ethnic group, in order to find employment, in order to be acceptable culturally, you assimilate into the dominant culture, which is the Amhara culture. Now, this experiment did not succeed. People were not easily assimilable. So by the 1960s, as the student movement was taking shape against the autocratic imperial rule, this question was raised, the question of the right of nationalities and nations. They were made subjects to the emperor, and they remained subjects. They never became citizens who would enjoy equality before the law, equal access to education, to employment, equal access to cultural venues and practices. This accumulated grievances raised this question known as the nationalities question. Should a person who finds himself or herself within the Ethiopian territory enjoy equal rights culturally, politically, economically, socially, accepted 
as citizens, not as subjects, and enjoy the same rights as the dominant group. It became the nationalities questions, one of the most important political questions of the last half century in Ethiopia. When the issue was raised as a political question within the Ethiopian student movement in 1968 as a nationalities question or the question of nations and nationalities, there were two solutions that were proposed. One group of students believed that there is no nationalities question in Ethiopia. There is a question of regionalism. That is, instead of being Oromo or Somali, the question that exists is the regions, the administrative regions like Walaga, Gojam, Gonder. So people have feelings of belonging, not to a nation, but to a region. The solution to that is, they said, is to give regional autonomy that the regions, there were 14 regions in the country at the time, that the regions would be granted the right to self-governance. The other solution that was proposed in the student movement was, no, these are separate ethnic groups. They have their own language, culture, and psychological makeup. They've always been treated as second-class citizens. They were never integrated into the empire. So the solution should be not regional, that's not a question that exists, not regional autonomy, but the right of self-determination up to and including secession. What the previous governments did was divided the country mainly using physical geography instead of along linguistic lines. For example, to separate present the Eritrea and the rest of Ethiopia, they used the Marab River as a boundary. Otherwise, if you uh, see the Eritrean Highlanders and the Tigrayan Highlanders, you don't see any difference linguistically, you don't see any difference culturally, you don't even see any difference physically. But uh, geography was used as a means of dividing them, so the Merab River was used as a boundary between present-day Eritrea and Tigray uh, along the southern border. And then uh, they also used the Tekkeze River some parts of Tigray were beyond the Takaza River, but Emperor Haile Selassie used the Takaza River to divide present-day Tigray and uh, present-day Wonder. They won the TPLF, which is the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Eritrea was part of Ethiopia at the time, so they had this nationalities question, but there was this colonial experience under the Italians for Eritrea. There was the Somali question as well, and there was the Oromo, the largest in the large land mass. All of this, were having the demand about the nationalities question is to have the right to secede, right to self-determination, up to and including secession from Ethiopia. They won the battle against the military government in 1991, and they implemented this solution that the ethnic groups should have the right to self-determination up to and including secession that Ethiopia henceforth would become a country, maybe a republic, where ethnic groups actually willingly, of their own volition, create a country, that no one is going to force anybody into that country. So it becomes a federation of the willing. The Oromo now make up a very huge portion of the Ethiopian state because they are found almost throughout the country. And then if you are to go from one uh, region to another, with the exception of adjacent Tigray, Afar, and Amhara, you would have to pass through Oromia. So Oromia is a very huge state. So why did Oromia happen to be? Because the primary criterion for the creation of the present day states in Ethiopia is language. Various parts of Oromia were under various provinces in the former governments, including the Emperor Haile Selassie and the Dirk, the military government, but the EPRDF overthrew the military government and then uh, took political power. Oromia was created as a big state. But in uh, Gambella, in Ben Shangul Gums and in Southern Nations and Nationalities and People's State, 
you see a lot of ethnic groups. In particular, if you take the Southern nations, nationalities and people's state, it has 56 out of the 84 ethnic groups in the country. So 56 of them are under the Southern nations, nationalities and people's state. This created a huge problem because it somehow created this Oromia regional state or Amhara regional state or Tsugrayan regional state and somehow it gives complete ownership of that particular state to that particular ethnic group which the regional state is named after its name. So that kind of created a second class citizen to those non-Tigrayans who are living in Tigray or non oromos who are living in Oromia. Federalism, however, is not a bad thing because what federalism does is it brings the government closer to the people. It's all about devolution of political power. That's a beautiful thing. But when that institutional setting is designed in a way that becomes very much divisive, that becomes very much a problem that creates a sort of entitlement to some people in their states and for the others to be considered basically settlers. That creates a huge problem. Of course, in Oromia, there were other questions because the city of Addis Ababa was about to be expanded because the city is very much congested, the government says. But the Oromo activists and the Oromo youth say, well, we would not see anything good coming out of this because we know that they are going to evict Oromo farmers from their land, and they will not even be compensated. We don't want them to be security men or guards or workers in factory in the land that they had owned. That created a huge problem in the central Ethiopia, right, with Addis Ababa and the Oromia protesters. Oromia, the largest Oromo region, that's where Addis Ababa is. The capital is within a Finfinne. The main economic activities are around Finfinne or Addis Ababa. Main resources of the country, agricultural resources, are located in Oromia. There is no way, economically speaking, that Oromia would become self-governing with power of ownership and regulation of their resources. So the federal system had to be subverted. But one thing that the people really fail to understand at times is that in Ethiopia, Land is nationalized. The federal government can come anytime and take your land. We have to be able to understand that despite our concerns about our land, our history, despite the fact that we are very much concerned about our possession as an ethnic group, we have to make sure that we also think about our individual rights. So in Ethiopia, group rights are somehow celebrated by the regime and by most narrow nationalists, but individual rights are not much celebrated. So right now, at this point, I really do not care much about whether the Oromos keep their lands. What I really care most about is whether an Oromo individual can keep his own land. I want that individual to have a title to that land. There have been different levels of border disputes and conflicts. The degree of the conflicts and the nature of the questions have been different, but there have been such border conflicts between different zones in Oromia and the southern region, for example. Maybe in some cases it led to some high casualties uh, in 1995, 1998, for example, between the Gedio and the Guji, then also between the Guji Oromo and the Burji in southern Ethiopia. So there have been a number of border disputes and still at some levels there are such border claims, but such border claims are not also to that level of the degree like the conflict between Oromia and Somali and the between Tigray and Amhara region. That is one of the things that lots of Ethiopians who oppose the whole idea of ethnic federation in the long run would actually lead to this kind of ethnic conflict. 
This idea did not exist before. But now, all of a sudden, it's the Ross, the Oromos, and the Somalis that used to live in peace with each other are now fighting on territory among them. While the border conflict was going on, then the state of emergency of 2016 was declared. And then the issue of the border contestation and the claims suspended. They have been trying to make some negotiations between the two regional states, but no conclusive agreement has been reached so far. And whenever such issues, border conflicts and so on arise, what the government usually does is politicians come together from the disputing regions or zones or whatsoever, and then they make a kind of political agreements mainly for media consumption, but with very low level of involvement of the local actors. And that makes such a conflict resolution approach not to be sustainable in most of the cases because conflicting parties, particularly at the local level, know the reasons for the conflict and even the methods of resolving such conflicts. But if they are neglected and not involved in the process, then only politicians cannot make a solution. Since the establishment of Tigray People's Liberation Front in their 1976 manifesto, they labeled their struggle as anti-Amara oppressors. And in order to achieve their struggle, they must destroy the old and the dominant Amara culture, which represents over 30% of the Ethiopian population, and replace it by a new and revolutionary culture. Beginning from 1991, coming to power of EPRDF, the Amharas have their own major difference. Many of the Amhara political parties claim that the federal arrangement it reduces people's level of national identity. They also claim that ethnic federalism restricts people's freedom of movement from one region to another and so on and so on. So what we see today also is a reflection of a very long level of disagreement, not on specific issues of land grabbing and massacre on the festival or those things, but they have a very major difference with EPRDF on the federal system. In Oromia, although there are... Uh, Few, few uh, political parties which doesn't accept the federal system. The major question of the Oromos is the constitutionally granted rights of self-administration, the right to political representation, the right to resource utilization, the right to self-government should be implemented as it is in the constitution. But on the contrary for the Amharas, from the very beginning, they oppose, many of them oppose the federal system. The Oromos happen to be one of the largest ethnic groups in Ethiopia and, of course, one of the largest in Eastern Africa. If you have this Oromo ethnic group within only Oromia regional state, keep it within Oromia. I mean, that is difficult, right? Because they should dominate Ethiopia, right? They should be all over. What is protecting a land to me? It's important. It's heritage. It is inheritance or so many things for so many reasons. But in this day and age, and forget globalization, right? In this day and age, Oromos must be able to dominate East Africa, let alone Ethiopia. You don't want to be just in that smaller box. Limiting Oromos' potential is extremely dangerous. Very much there are now, the most important political actors in Ethiopia, most of them do not speak Amharic, but it is something that 80 or so percent of Ethiopians speak. The Oromos speaking Amharinya will give them the opportunity to work pretty much in the 80 percent of Ethiopia. But I do accept the idea of strengthening the cultures of each. For example, the Oromos actually speaking their own language even using it in schools, which was not allowed under Haile Selassie and under Dirk, you have to speak Amharic. Now, you can learn in the Oromo language. 
you can go to court and you can actually communicate in your own language. But at that time you were not able to do that. And if you did it, you had to use a translator, what they call Simabalo. Those kinds of cultural rights are essential, and I support that. The root cause, the beginning and the end of all our problem is ethnic federalism. Even the movements that start, which identifies itself based on ethnicism, one needs to step back and look at what is the stated goal? What is it that you're going to achieve? Actually, for those who say ethnic federalism is all bad, it is simple. They actually have their own personal political agendas. They're actually trying to to wrap their agenda on face of everybody else's. Ethnic federalism has issued so many gains in Ethiopia that actually people have never dreamt of because I'm a Somali. All my ancestry, my father fled the Dirk regime. My grandfather was also affected. There is no single Somali family that has never suffered under different Ethiopian regimes. So the fact that the Somali people, for example, and all other ethnic groups for that matter, are given the right to self-govern themselves is something that actually needs to be applauded, admired, and supported, and encouraged. But when it comes to the right of secession, it is very dangerous. The only place where the right of secession was allowed was in the Soviet Union, and in the end, we know what happened. Many of them are even fighting today because of that. Article 39 was put into place to attempt to ensure that various nations, nationalities, and religious groups within the Ethiopian nation state had some level of protection. And should they be abused, as they had in the past, that they have the right to secede and self-administer, self-administer and determine their fate. And I'm not sure that I share the sentiment that that's a negative thing. That could lead to a more lasting peace if one can't get along as a group. And the danger of ethnic federalism is that it becomes a recipe for creating Bantustans, small, small nations. And if you are small, small nations, you can't control your own destiny. You become an easy prey for bigger powers. To tell you frankly, the only way that we will benefit all of us, whether it is Eritreans, the rest of the Ethiopian, the Habashas, the Somalis, Oromo, Amaram, and all of them, is if we are together. We are the same people. There is no point of like, you know, dividing each other, it's like splitting hair. There are others that would argue that a lot of times when these ethnic federations don't survive, it's because the underlying issue that is trying to be reconciled by the system of governance is so deep that it might be better to administer at a more localized level. Ethnic federalism? I don't like it. But you know what? We can even keep some form of arrangement that has some ethnic composition because at the end of the day, you need some language, right? You can't just divide one community that speaks the same language put it in different regional states because if they could be together, it's really a good thing. So I think that should not be a problem. But some regional states, like example Amhara and Oromia especially, are very big. If you divide the Amhara regional states into two and kind of create Western Amhara and Eastern Amhara, and if you kind of like divide the Oromia regional states like into three and create like Western Oromia, Central Oromia and Southern Oromia, even by keeping that ethnic identity together, would create more manageable regional states. The regional constitutions have a huge problem. Like the Oromia regional state constitution when it comes to addressing the rights of non-Oromos in Oromia. Today, you could move from Colorado to Georgia and purchase a house or a property the same day. Or get a driver license, like an ID the same day, an apartment the same day. Because there is this good faith and credit aspect of the United States Constitution. We may have it addressed in the country's federal constitution, but Ethiopia's original constitutions really lack 
I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not a lawyer, right? But to my understanding, there are so many huge problems that need to be addressed. So that we don't have any second class citizenship. Also, you have five or so regional states that are considered developing regional states. That just doesn't make any sense. In principle, ethnic federalism is not the cause for the conflict that we see today. It could have addressed many of the problems and the questions that different ethnicities, nations, nationalities have been raising under the imperial regime, under the military regime in the past. But the way ethnic federalism was implemented was not fully congruent to the constitutional provisions. What they are actually conflating when they are actually claiming every ill in the Ethiopian society in ethnic federalism is that at the core of all the issues that we're talking about lies justice, equality, personal freedom, the right for self-expression, all those democratic values and personal freedoms that are actually most people take for granted. That's actually what's missing in the piece. You have a federal form, but the way it operates is very much like a, a centralized administrative state. So it's not working the way it's supposed to. There's not much bottom-up consultation or influence over policy. If it was operating properly, it would. The people would have more of a say as to what goes on in their neighborhood, in their state, but they don't. It's basically top-down, central control. Yeah, in most of my papers, I say this is a kind of unintended consequence of ethnic federalism that ethnic federalism further dichotomized differences and polarized the interaction between groups than building on common values. And politicians, for example, particularly at lower levels, continuously have been building on differences between groups, not only differences, but also on memories of antagonism than on issues of nation building. It was colonialism that actually divided Ethiopia into two in the first place. Okay, so all the problem we have today comes from that. I mean, many of the challenges and the problems we face today have been referred back to the late 19th century as other African countries did. The period when a group, a king from the northern Ethiopia, mainly based in the Amhara, conquered the different states in the south, in Oromia and the others. The contemporary political narratives in Ethiopia are one way or another framed toward this, that historical phenomenon. I think it would be better to see Ethiopian case as internally evolving. You know, what we have is this problem of inter-ethnic competition that somehow blinds the people's need for unity and togetherness and remaining as one when it comes to achieving some political freedom, democratization, reforms in general, for pushing for all these good things. So that is a problem. So what is the end result of this ethnic federalism? That is what we're seeing right now. People dying because of their ethnicity. When you ask a question that seems like framed against the regime, you may be considered like somebody who made hate to grace. But no, Ethiopians don't do that. I have so much faith in all Ethiopians, in all Ethiopian ethnic groups. And I can proudly say that no ethnic group in Ethiopia hates another ethnic group. Or will have that some kind of grudge. Everything is just politics. And there is no way that they can destroy the current constitution and the current regional states. It's reached a point of no return now.